Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Still enjoying short stories? Two minutes? Not really two minutes? Because we have more of them. Three more tales from My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Our first story this time is The Green Umbrella. The green umbrella was old and shabby, but it had not always been so. Once it had been a beautiful silk umbrella and belonged to a rich lady who lived in a big house. But she was a careless lady, and one day she went for a walk and left the umbrella hanging on some railings in a park. There it was found by a little man who was a clown and who worked in a circus. He took it home to his caravan, which he shared with a cat and a dog. Every evening he took the green umbrella into the circus ring, where he would ride with it on a very odd-looking cycle. Sometimes he would perch the green umbrella on the top of his nose, and sometimes on the top of his head. And when he was upside down, as he often seemed to be, the umbrella would be perched on the tip of his big toe. It never knew where it was going to find itself. Still, it behaved very well and never once disgraced its master, the clown, by falling down. Then one sad day it found itself no longer wanted. The clown had some new tricks and the umbrella was thrown onto a rubbish dump. It wondered what would become of it then. It soon found out. A tramp picked it up. He seemed very pleased with it and slung it over his shoulder with his lunch tied to its handle, all done up in a red spotted handkerchief. They traveled all over the country together, through towns and villages, past houses and haystacks. They never passed the haystacks at night. They slept in them, and very cozy and warm they were. Then in the morning, on they went again, until one day they parted company. They didn't want to part company. It was an accident. The umbrella fell over into a stream while they were sitting together having lunch. Although the tramp tried to rescue it, the wind blew it away far away along the stream until it was caught by some rushes and drifted to the bank. A duck found it. This duck, which was known as a shoveler duck, quickly shoveled some grass and leaves into it and then laid some eggs. Before long, some baby shovelers were hatched and the umbrella became a nursery for the baby ducks. But as soon as they were old enough, they all shoveled off and the umbrella was left on its own. Strangely enough, it didn't mind. It had traveled a lot and seen many things, exciting things too, but now it was tired. So it settled itself down in the rushes where no one would see it and watch the rest of the world go by. It saw many shoveler ducks go by, and it saw summer and winter go by. When spring came again and fresh flowers bloomed and young birds sang in the trees, the green umbrella felt very much like rising up in the morning breeze and sailing away, but it didn't. It stayed where it was and gave shelter to all sorts of little animals who felt safe under the friendly umbrella. When it said a very odd-looking cycle, I wanted to say, right after that, a odd-looking unicycle, one would say. You could have jumped in. I know it's a little difficult on these shorter ones. Yeah, but I think I got used to when we were doing the first set of stories. <laughs> the art is very colorful on this one. Also, they use the word tramp. I guess that's where a lady in the tramp comes from, huh? The word tramp there. I just never associated it with a homeless person. Is there a difference or? <laughs> I haven't looked up the definitions of the words and semantics change the meanings of words over time. Hmm. So when this was written, that may have been the main vernacular used for a person who did not have a regular address. Hmm. There could also be variances between those who travel and those who stay around because this character did a lot of traveling. Mm. Not all those who do not have a permanent residence in the traditional sense do a lot of traveling. Mm. Also, the clown has those X eyes like he's been knocked out. See, I never saw it that way. Thank you, Lux. I always saw that that's the line of his eyes being closed and the line going across is part of his face makeup. Yeah, I thought of that right after I said what I said. But right now, it's just like, you can't unsee it. Like the Resident Evil 6 logo. I'm not going to describe it here, but it's interesting once you find out what people think it looks like. And all the images are really colorful, like I said. Nice illustration of the umbrella on top of the clown's nose. 
on top of a unicycle. And then there's the tramp with his, with kind of a standard tramp outfit. It also reminds me a lot of Oliver Twist, one of the characters from that story. And then we have all the ducks and the flowers and the mice and snails and bunnies all underneath the umbrella on the next page. Yeah, so we show sections of different parts of the umbrella's life, except the very beginning, where the green umbrella was with a very great lady. Hmm. Um, rich lady. <laughs> also, it's a very durable umbrella. Yes, well, it is made of silk. And now on to the greedy gobbler. Sounds interesting. And the art is kind of reversed from a lot of the art that has the yellow and the black. I'll tell you why after she reads the story. <laughs> Sarah had 50 cents to spend. It was such a lot of money for Sarah that she did not know how to spend it. She went to the little toy shop around the corner and looked at the hundreds of exciting things in the window. Some of the toys were much more than 50 cents, the sort that ants buy for little girls and boys, and some were less than 50 cents, the sort of toys Sarah bought with her weekly pocket money. Sarah looked and looked. Suddenly, she saw something that was exactly 50 cents, and she immediately knew that was just what she wanted. It was a yellow glass pig. She went into the shop and waited to be served. She was very excited, and she hoped that no one would buy that funny yellow glass pig before it was her turn. At last, it was Sarah's turn to be served. Please, I would like to have that yellow pig in the window, she said. Ah, said Miss Higgins, I know the one you mean because it is the only one in the shop. Mrs. Higgins fished about in the shop window. She took a long time because the window was crammed with toys and she didn't want to upset them all. Sarah hopped about from one foot to the other. At last, Mrs. Higgins brought it out. There, she said, and the funny yellow glass pig winked in the bright light. Oh, but it has a slit in its back, said Sarah. What's that for? It's a piggy bank, you know said Mrs. Higgins. Sarah didn't know what a piggy bank was, and she didn't like to ask. Oh, she said, just a little quietly. She gave Mrs. Higgins the 50 cents, and Mrs. Higgins wrapped it up very carefully. Sarah carried it home very carefully. She didn't even peep in the paper in case she dropped him. She showed it to Daddy when she got in. Oh, a piggy bank, said Daddy. And she showed it to Mother, and Mother said, Oh, a dear little piggy bank. And she showed it to Auntie, and Auntie said, What a sweet little piggy bank. And she showed it to Granny, and Granny said, What a darling little piggy bank. I'm seeing a trend here, folks. What is a piggy bank? asked Sarah. Everyone seemed to know except Sarah. It's to put your money in, said Granny. Sarah looked a little sad. She thought she was going to cry. Why, what's the matter? asked Daddy. Well... First I had some money and no piggy bank, said Sarah. Now I have a piggy bank and no money. That is a bit of a roundabout of a problem. Everyone laughed. Let me be the first to put a penny in, they all said at once. And Daddy and Mother and Auntie and Granny all put a penny in. That was four pennies, wasn't it? And the little pig gobbled them up and they tinkled inside his tummy. I shall call him Gobbler, said Sarah. I'll put a penny in every time you bring the newspaper, said Daddy. I'll put a penny in every time you go to bed at the right time, said Mother. I'll put a penny in every time you take my dog for a walk, said Auntie. And I'll put a penny in every time you find my glasses for me, said Granny. Sarah brought the newspaper and went to bed at the right time and took the dog for a walk and found Granny's glasses and everyone popped in their pennies. His stomach is getting very full, laughed Sarah. He is a greedy gobbler. I hate to see the day when the girl, especially with those older piggy banks, realizes what you have to do to get the money out. Yeah. This is why they started putting holes in the bottom of piggy banks. Mm-hmm. And this is why the art is different with the way they'd use the yellow and the ink. In the other images where they've used the yellow, the yellow has been the color on the inside of the ink. They use it as a highlight, like a background, and they mostly use the gray scale of the ink to do the shading and the outlining. And actually, there isn't really much outlining. Everything just has 
shade. It's just using shade to create the shapes and lines, and they use the yellow to help accent the shapes of faces where they couldn't use the gray shadows of the ink to make a outline. Like for instance, the outlines of the faces in some of the other shots where it's the granny and Sarah, the yellow is there to give an outline of the face compared to this shot over here where it's in a dark shop where they could use the ink to make the outline of the characters. Also, we have another poem. Well, song. No, I'm not singing. It's called Fisherman's Song. I'd like to catch a big fish. I'd like to catch a few. But the only thing I ever caught was a battered old shoe. So I throw them dainty morsels. I throw them lots of bread. But the only thing I ever caught was a cold in the head. Cute. And the picture that goes along with it, for a second I was going to say, like, well, that doesn't fit the rest of the story. Oh, yeah, it fits the poem, though. It's a cute little kid fishing with one of those classic fishing rods. It's not really a fishing rod. It's a stick with a string on the end of it. Yeah, stick and string. It's amazing how many things are just stick and string. Fishing, archery. All right, so moving on. The Storks of Strasbourg. No, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. I don't even know if I'll be consistent throughout the story. Well, one can try. Strasbourg is a beautiful old town in France. One day there was great excitement in the streets of Strasbourg. Everyone was staring up at the sky. The storks had arrived. The first pair were perched on the roof of one of the oldest houses in the town. Every spring they arrived from the south, from Africa and Egypt. Across the blue Mediterranean Sea they flew, to nest in the chimneys of the old Strasbourg houses. The people were so pleased to see them because they believed the storks were lucky birds. Well, the storks nest in our chimney tops, we shall enjoy good fortune, they told one another. In they flew, these big white birds with black wings, their necks stretched straight out as they wheeled above the houses with their red legs trailing behind them. Down they came onto the rooftops to find a chimney in which to build a nest. Some of them returned to their last year's nest. Some were unlucky because the winter snows had torn their nests apart and washed them down the steeply sloping roofs. But some nests needed only a little bit of repairing to make them ready to use again. And so the storks began to be very busy with the work they'd flown so far to do. And the people of Strasbourg could not stand all day either and watch the storks. They had to be busy too and wait patiently for the exciting day when the baby storks would be hatched. The birds worked hard. Mr. Stork did most of the hunting for the materials for the nest. He collected lumps of earth, bits of twigs, grass, sticks, and paper from wherever he could find them. Mrs. Stork made them into a sort of platform on the chimney top until she had built her large nest. When at last the nests were all finished, the birds laid their eggs. Some laid three eggs, some four, and some five in their nests. The storks took turns to sit on their eggs. Mr. Stork usually sat on them at night, and Mrs. Stork sat on them during the day. About four weeks later, the eggs hatched. What a noise and bustle there was up in the chimney tops. And what appetites those baby storks had. They ate and ate and ate. The parents had to work really hard to fill their tummies. And so spring passed, and the warm summer and the young storks grew big and strong and were able to fly around like their parents. Then one day in autumn, the people of Strasbourg looked up and saw that the storks were preparing to leave. The days were getting cold, and the storks wanted to fly back to the south, to the warmer lands. Up in the air they flew, and for a time they seemed to hang there, hardly moving. Then suddenly there was a great flapping of wings, and they were away. Higher and higher they rose, Round and round they circled, until at last they disappeared into the blue of the sky. Goodbye, waved the people in the streets. Goodbye, storks. Come back to us in the spring. They didn't feel sad, because they knew the storks would return in the spring, as they always did every year. Another full-color illustration. They seem to alter back and forth. I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm guessing the full-color drawings are one artist and the ink with the yellow is a different artist because they have two illustrators for this book. So I'm guessing one prefers that style and the other prefers this style. I wonder if they charged the same or paid the same between the two artists. I wonder if the artists even knew because this is a wonderful full color drawing. The storks are well rendered, very proportioned, 
the young storks are there. The nests are done in such a way that the coloring gives you a lot of the texture of the nest. There's a lot of detail for the line work as well, but mostly the coloring is what really gives you the texture. Then we have the nice way they did the rooftops with the inking accenting, and the way they used kind of a erasing technique or a faded technique to create some wear patterns on the rooftops. But now I have a question for the story and the people who live in this town. If the storks make their nests in your chimneys, how do you have a fireplace? It's spring and summer. Yeah, but they state that some of the nests are there all year round. Yes, I think when they're saying chimney top, they don't actually mean the actual exit, the smoke exit. Especially since there's a variety of different chimney styles in this shot. There's a couple of the classic square ones you're kind of used to seeing. Then they have the more kind of, I don't want to say modern, because they're not really that modern, but it's a sealed off top with two smaller holes. And the nest that we see, we see really close up and it's hard to see where exactly it is. And with all these other roofs, you do see, see, and that stork's nest is actually on a chimney, that one there right in the crease. So how does that work? And also, isn't that usually a problem? And aren't the storks kind of big for this to reasonably work? I know storks can nest in s situations like this. I'm just kind of curious about the whole thing. It's like, they tell you to keep your chimneys clear, and if a bird is nesting on top of it, things from the nest will fall down into the chimney. So even if you clear the nest off the top, you have to clean out the entire chimney. Chimney sweeps must have a real good job in this area. Because, I mean, you usually hear about problems with chimneys with, like, starling nests. But it's interesting, and none of this set of three were ones that... I tended to read over and over so they weren't oh yeah I remember 90% of the story is like oh yeah this is one I didn't really read much oh here's another one I didn't really read much wow three in a row wow I was a picky kid so what do you think about these three stories other than like I don't remember them much oh uh, the green umbrella was very similar to the story of the teapot that's what I was thinking which we also said was similar to other stories about a collar and a glass bottle. The greedy gobbler was cute because she had a whole 50 cents to spend. Back when 50 cents would buy you something. Mm hmm. Speaking of greedy gobblers, we're gonna have pie after this. <laughs> Mostly homemade pie. It's amazing what you can do with store bought ingredients. Mm hmm. And it's amazing how tasty junk food can be when you allow yourself to have it when you got it on sale. So pie. I like pie. But yeah, as I said during the Greedy Gobbler, I don't want to hear how she's going to react when, how do we get the money out? Dad, why do you have a hammer? Yeah, I mean, I understand the idea because it forces you to save the money. You have to really want it to get it. But still... I think it was a conspiracy by the piggy bank manufacturers. Because <laughs> you had to keep getting new ones. Kind of like Sue said, I create my own problems. <laughs> <laughs> I get myself in business. So this has been three stories from the My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories. Edited by Rosemary Garland. Illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. As for the individual stories, The Green Umbrella was written by Margaret Connor, The Greedy Gobbler was written by Rosemary Garland, and The Storks of Strasbourg was also written by Margaret Connor. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, please check out other entries in the Embers Reading Room catalog. We've done several of the two-minute stories now, so there's a whole playlist of those plus several other playlists, and then a really long playlist of all the episodes. If you're interested in looking at something that's not a book, check out the main content where we do mostly pop culture items. Are you enjoying these two-minute stories? We'll see if we can't find the book. I know we've probably posted links to it in the other two videos if we found it, but we'll see if we can still keep finding it or something similar. Maybe something by some of the same authors or with the same illustrators. You know, something that has the same kind of feel. Just feel like some general shopping? I'm sure we've got a plain Amazon link there. Also, the Ebates link, uh, it's really good during the holiday season. Cashback, online shopping, 
Also works at stores if you link a credit card. $10 welcome bonus with the qualifying purchase, which is $25. So you spend $25, you get back $10. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.